rotor, the lead weight, and the hook. That's sort of what we've got right here. The line, here's our little floater. There's a little BB weight underneath, and there's the hook. Oh, and you'll notice that I did not hook the hook in the eye ring. I hooked it up here on the little foot. If you hook your hook in the eye ring, it's going to scratch it and deal, and that way it'll be like sandpaper on your line. But that's just your basic fishing rig, and that's, you know, on a, a little light spinning rod. Uh, one of the hand poles that you see at all the fishing supply stores, it's a telescoping rod. Uh, you could use a bamboo pole. Bamboo pole's a little bit cheaper, but this thing, look, it packs down to, what is this, about three feet? Let's see if we can just pull it out here. See how it extends out? About 12 feet, and your line is about the same length as your pole. So that's a, that's a good starting outfit. Like I say, about eight feet. You can work uh, like at Hawaii Kai, the, the breakwaters out the Waianae Coast side, the rocky cliffs or wherever you happen to be fishing, the fishing out on the pier in Kaneohe mm -hmm. at Heia. So it, it's a good all around pole, even if you take the kids to Ho'o Malahia for the freshwater fishing. And again, when you're through, you just pull it back down. Uh, it's got these little line holders so you just wrap it around and da 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 you are good to go won't hurt a bit did it <laughs> now if you really want to spend some money look at this little baby believe it or not this is a 10 foot pole start extending it there we go whoa look at this baby you want to use probably no more than four pound test breaking strength line. If you do, you're going to break the rod. What you want to do is break the leader and let the fish get away rather than break the expensive rod. And you're using uh, bread or let's say dough balls or dough bait. The guys over on Kauai are really fanatical about that. They will get the trout pellets that they, that they feed the trout and they'll crush them up into a powder and mix them with different stuff, with water and flour, maybe add a little uh, root beer or uh, what was the one, garlic scent or something like that. And they make these dough balls out of it and that's what they use for the trout bait. Uh, Mike Sakamoto again taught me, he would get a, some kind of oily tuna fish. He, his favorite was, uh, oh, what was that? Tomato sardines with a lot of oil in it, right? And you, you get it and you really just mash it up into a paste. And then you start adding flour to that and you keep mixing and mixing the flour in until it won't stick to your hands. And then you get a little dough ball, you know, the size of a green pea for the kind of hooks that we're using. And you put that right on the hook and it caught fish like crazy because you've got, it stays on the hook good. It's got the smell. As it's sitting in the water, you know, it sort of melts and leaches that tuna fish oily smell out of it. And it, was, it worked great, man. <coughs> okay. Um, and it's super easy to catch fish. So I guess from your experience, how would you explain? How would you uh, why go? Why go there? Yeah, like why go to Hopemala here as opposed to okay. right there? Um, I think a little bit add on to that, like uh, what should people look for when trying to find a spot um, like rocky shorelines or, you know, somewhere where it would produce a lot of fish on the inshore. Um, obviously, like where the sand meets and it's kind of like <coughs> a flat, there's not uh -huh. going to be as many fish as to where you go at breakwater and there's fish in the rocks. Well, again, the most important thing is they've got to have action and it's got to be safe. That's what's nice about Ho'omalahia. It's a nice uh, manicured grassy area. You can walk down. Even if you fall in, it's only like two or three feet deep. You can right, just reach yeah. in and grab the kid and pull them out. Yeah. So it's a safe place and there's lots of fish there and they're very cooperative. So that to me is what makes it. Uh, most of the piers and breakwaters in Hawaii, I guess the key is, okay, what do they call that? Look for the bunkhouse and the chow hall. Where do they live and where do they eat and what do they eat like that? So let's say around uh, Heia Pier, where I sort of grew up over there in Kaneohe. If you look straight down, 
you know, it's sort of rocky and everything, and you can see the little fish swimming around in there. Uh, there's structure, there's rocks. The little fish can hide in there. There's crabs, and they're all around there, so the larger fish that eat crabs or eat the little shrimp that are hanging around, they're gonna hang around. So we've got a food source and we've got a place to hide. So, I guess structure. Uh, a sandy area, there's probably gonna be less fish because there is no structure for those kind of fish to hide in. But you will find the kind of fish that feed in that area. Here in Hawaii, we are uh, blessed and we're cursed by the tides. Like if you're going for the Oeo, I always went in a sandy channel. You know, you've got the reef, you've got the nice deep channel with a sandy bottom. You know that the Papio and the Oeo they're gonna be traveling down there. They're, they're there and they're, they're eating. It never dawned on me that when the tide came up, that these fish, I'm talking about a fish the size of your leg, you know, 10, 12 pounds, this long, this big around, they'll come up in water six, eight inches deep on top of that reef at high tide to feed. So, wow! So. In that case, we had to sort of, well, when is the tide coming up? When are these fish gonna start migrating up on there? If the tide's going down or low, they're gonna be leaving, so no use fishing there. But if the whole flat is draining off on one little corner or one little area, maybe that's a good place to fish because stuff, food is being washed down. So maybe your papillo and other predator fish will be hanging around like at the mouth of the river, in this case, where the, the water flows off the reef to get them like that. So that's just, what do they eat and where do they feel safe? Where do they live? That's the, the two key things to look for. I think the biggest thing to look for uh, when you're freshwater fishing is tree branches, <coughs> yeah. rocks, uh, somewhere where the shoreline gets a little bit deeper, a little drop off. Um, for saltwater, you wanna look for rocks, breakwaters, um, and I also believe the tide has a big influence on the feeding behavior of the fish, whether, you know, it would be off of breakwater or out pelagic yeah. fishing for tuna. Yes. Um, I always find it best morning and evening, and then mm -hmm. when the tide's changing from a low to high, or a high to low, when the tide's moving, fish tend yeah. to be feeding the yes. most. Yeah. Um, okay, certain times of the year, when the, during the winter, the water is going to be cool or cold. So they may be up in the shallow coves where that water warms up quicker by the sun. In the summer, they may be deeper areas. Again, structure. Are they going to be around piers? Are they going to be around rocky, uh, rocky points or rock piles or things like that? So it's, you got you to know the fish. If you want to catch the fish, you got to learn the habits of the fish. That's why it's so important to, you know, Study the fish. Well, what I, I want to go look for Papio. Okay, read as much as you can about Papio. Go and see the YouTube videos. You know, learn about it. That's that's the key. This is what I call my knot tying kit. I've got a little wooden dowel with an eye screw in there, and then two pieces of cord, different colors. You'll notice. Uh, these are three feet long. If I was going to do it again, I think I'd make it four feet long. This is good for learning how to tie fishing knots or any knots for that matter. And you'll notice this is not parachute cord. It's a more soft and uh, supple kind of a cord. Okay, let's, let's try this one. We're going to do the improved clinch knot. This is one of the first knots that most people ever learn. So we'll take our hook or our leader here put the tag in through. I'm going to turn it this way. So now we've got our tag in and we've got our main line. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to make five turns around here. You do five or six turns. I think that's about, well, that's about four or five. Now you see this little loop that we've got here? We're going to go through that. And now I've made a second loop up here on the top and I'm going to come back and go through that this. Now before you snug this down, you want to lubricate the knot. You can use water, you can spit on it. But the reason we do that 
if you pull this and it's dry, it's going to create friction, heat, and it will deteriorate the line. So we wet it and then we just sort of snug it down. And that is your improved clinch knot. Now there's a lot of different kind of knots to use. Uh, this is just one of the ones that we learned. I like the clinch knot and I understand that uh, there's another way to tie this clinch knot that I had not seen before. And I would love to see somebody show me how to do that. So there's many different variations of the clinch knot. Um, personally, I grew up using the improved clinch knot. Um, as we grew older, this is another very simple knot, um, yet a lot more, a lot stronger than the improved clinch knot, in my opinion. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to simply stick the line through. Um, you want a decent amount of uh, line to go through. What you're going to do is, same thing as a clinch knot, but you're going to do opposite. So you're going to make a ring, and then you're going to pull out the tag line. Then what you're going to do, if you have a weight, uh, you can easily just wrap it about five times. Um, if you're using a small hook, what I do is I kind of put my middle finger right here and bring this around. You don't want to do more than five to six twists or else the knot gets a little bit, um, it just gets too much. So you want to aim for five to six at most. So here we go. And then what you're going to do is you're going to grab the tag line and you're going to put it back through the bottom loop. And then what you're going to do is bring it back through the top loop. And how to cinch this, um, you want to lubricate it in some way. Um, I use my saliva, just kind of like that. Since we're using rope, can't do that. So all you're going to do is you're going to pull both lines and see how it's cinching right there. You're going to let go of the tag line. And then once it is on the eye of the hook, you're going to pull this tag line and then cinch it down. And we call this the San Diego Knot in California, but it has many names, so. I had a bunch of little kids out here and I was trying to teach them how to use a hand pole. I would have the wind at my back. So it's easy, it's a lot easier to cast with the wind than, than against the wind. But for demonstration purposes only, what I've got on the ground is a thing called backyard bass. We're not trying to do this and cast overhead. We're not trying to hook our buddy on the side over here. We got to be safe. So we'll just put this right out here like that. Ease in here and fish on. That's how you teach little kids how to use a hand pole. Okay, when using a spinning rod, again, if this was with the kids out here, I would have the wind at my back. Again, it's a lot easier to cast with the wind than it is against the wind, especially when you're beginning. So the first thing we're gonna do is take our trigger finger, our index finger, and grab the line. Then with our other hand, open the bail. Now when we point our finger, the line's gonna go. So if we cast like this, there we are. Now, a lot of people will just turn the handle to close the bale. I do not recommend that. I recommend closing it with your hand. Now you see all this line that's sort of falling down? You can't really, but there, believe me. If you lift your rod tip, now the line's straight, now you start to reel. And then you just reel in and, oh, we got a fish on, we got a fish on. Lift, reel, and there we go. Uh, for a little short, like that, for instance, whole Malahia, we're not supposed to be casting. Again, we could use it just like we used our hand pole and just flip it out like that. Close the bale, lift the rod, straighten that line out, then start reeling. And let's see. Oh, look at that. We caught another one. Look at that. Nothing to this fishing. <laughs>